All right, so welcome to the, the second part. Um, you have the floor, please. Right? Okay. So, um, so we've talked a little bit about you know the concepts behind um, you know the, the book. Um, basically, you know, just to, as an overview, so that we kind of start from square one clearly. Uh, the book is based on taking the twelve tricord set classes. And set class in 12-tone theory just means family, okay? So it's like set class just means family. And, and when we say family, we mean trichords that have the same interval content. So if I have a trichord that is uh, a half step and a whole step, that is equivalent to a trichord that has a whole step and a half step, right? And what we would do is, uh, in 12-tone music, it's very useful and uh, composers have used for a long time, the idea of integer notation, which we were talking about before, where you number the chromatic scale from 0 to 11. And there's a lot of reasons to do that. It's very useful when you're composing. Um, but, uh, and also, that what they would do is, 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 when they talk about a trichord, they would name it using the interval, uh, integer notation. So, a trichord that was C, C sharp, D, they would call O, 1, 2. And that's the set class. They would say, oh yeah, set class on one, two, right? And, you know, everybody knows that. But for us, uh, as jazz musicians, it's, it, it's a little more confusing if we use integer notation, if we call things by their numbers. So what, what I've done and what I like to do is I call the trichords by their interval content, which is a lot more useful for us because we deal with intervals all the time when we're improvising. We have to think, in, you know, Relationships between chord changes. What are the you know functionally? What are they? One you know one six two five you know. So we're used to doing that. So what I've done is I call each set class by its interval content. Now we have twelve different set classes, um, and uh, we have seven of them are non-symmetric, and five are symmetric. Okay, meaning that the interval content is the same. So one plus one, two plus two, three plus three. 4 plus 4. Those are all symmetric. And the last one, we wouldn't call, well, it's, it's uh, symmetric as well, and it's 5 plus 5, but it's prime, well, we'll get into this, F prime form, uh, I'll explain in a moment. It's a little complicated. There's some, like, basic terminology that's helpful to know. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play for you these different sound classes so you can hear what they sound like as chords um, in their prime form, or the, what we would, prime form in 12-tone music is what we would think of as being root position, okay? So if you have a C major triad, well, root position is C, E, G, right? Well, we would call that prime form in 12-tone music. And so the first trichord would be one half step and one half step. Right? Now, if I play that as a melody, we've all heard that. If I play it as a chord, it's a little more dissonant, right? But as a musical uh, object, it's very useful, and it's, it's, uh, we'll, I'll demonstrate some ways of using this uh, quarterly in a moment when I play them as in uh, rotations. Next one, one plus two. Next one, one plus three. One plus four. One plus five. Okay. Then the next trichord sets are two plus two. Plus three, which is our diminished triad. Then we have three plus four, which is the minor triad. Now, and then we have uh, four, three, uh, four plus four, which is our augmented triad. Now, for every non-symmetric trichord, it has a partner that is its inversion. So, we were the first non-symmetric trichord we I played for you was one plus two. Its partner is two plus one, so I played C, C sharp, E flat, and its partner would be a trichord two plus one, right? Two plus one. Okay, they belong to the same set class, and it's important that we realize this because we use both of those in the twelve tone. Next one would be one plus three, or one uh, three plus one, which is C E flat E. I just played. Next one would be one plus four. Four plus one. All right? 
and so on. So each of the non-symmetric ones, we have, uh, have mirror images. Okay? And this is um, important because we're going to want to be able to practice both of these. So when we're starting to learn our trichords, um, an important thing to remember is as we work on these, we're going to try and use these in several different ways in improvisation. One is we want to just be able to play single trichord and be able to use that and improvise on that. Okay? Because um, that in itself is, is a useful tool when we're improvising to be able to break things down into their single trichord applications. Then we're going to look at them in trichord pairs, and then we're going to look at them as drawn from the 12-tone row, tri trichord pairs drawn from the 12-tone row, and all the permutations of that. So if we have in a 12-tone row, we have four trichords that express all 12 pitches. So, for example, we'll start with trichord 1 plus 2. It's the simplest one. Now that's one plus three. The next trichord in that row would be two plus uh, one, but it's starting on D. And the next one starts on F sharp, and it would be one plus two. And the next one would be two plus one, starting on A flat. Okay. So that's the twelve tone row that's built on the structure of that chord, that one plus two. When we want to try and practice these things, it's useful as an improviser to treat them the way we would, uh, you know, major and minor chords. Um, you know, as improvisers, we practice our major and minor arpeggios and all this stuff. So it's important that you want to practice these in terms of playing them as isolated melodic fragments. So I'll play it very softly with something. Wait. It's the way that you would want to practice these. Now we have what all these prime form trichords, and they can be played so just going up chromatically, playing all the root position, or what we would call prime form. Then the next thing you would want to be able to do is play through them in what's called first rotation. Now, first rotation is when we take the first pitch and we place it on top. Right? So it would be... Okay? So I'm playing B flat, B flat, C. Now... We do that same shape and we play through all transpositions. Just to get familiar with it, right? And be able to play the trichords as a little melodic unit unto itself. The next thing that we would is useful is that as we practice these and we get more familiar with them to play longer patterns. So if I started with just the first trichord, I would play through the range of my instrument. Right, just as if it was like a little scale or a little arpeggio. Play it in, and something that um, is important to realize as well is as you start to work on these just as isolated trichords, the idea of these being in different rotations is a very important aspect of this because these are, for every trichord, you have basically three different objects that exist. You've got root position, first rotation, and then second rotation. Okay? Now if I think in terms of breaking melody down into a variety of shapes, when we play three pitches, there's a limited, there's only six ways that we can actually play them. Okay? So if I take a C major triad, I can go up it, I can go down it. Fifth to the right or so these are the basic shapes that we have that we can play when dealing with three with three pitches. There's no other ones. If you're not going to repeat a pitch, that's it. That's all you can do. So when you're practicing these, it's very important that you think about what is the direction, what is the shape I'm playing on each one of these. So as I play these, if I go prime form, I just went up it. Now if I go down, first rotation. Now I'm going to go to second rotation and go up that. Right? Okay? And to take each one of these shapes that we have and think in terms of playing each one of these rotations as a, as a unique musical object. Now we have this whole melodic kind of palette there.
to exploit just playing three notes. Okay? And there's a lot of different shapes that we can play when we just think in terms of playing three notes as our melodic phrase. The next way that, that is very useful to approach this and to be aware of is let's take these three notes and let's repeat one. So now we have a melodic shape that has four pitches with one repeated. Okay, now what I did was I took the first note, which is C, and I repeated it on top. So now I have a four note shape. And if I start each rotation, the next one, and I um, start to practice these in different uh, directional uh, shapes, there are a lot of different kinds of, of melodic content that we can get to. Um, uh, there's a number, probably like, I forget how many, I have to look in the book, but there's like 50, like 54 different shapes we can get to dealing with four note groupings and all the different shapes. You know, just there's a lot in each rotation as well. So when you're working on these, you know, be, be very conscious of like, what is the melodic shape that I'm playing? Because this will come into play very important when we start dealing with more than one trichord. When you start combining two, three, four trichords and your melodic content and, you, and the shape of what you're doing and your developing of your solo, um, this is really very useful. It gets it in your ear because obviously as improvisers everything has to be kind of conditioned and to be instinct. So we don't want to be thinking about it ultimately when we're playing. That's you know why we practice so much. So. <laughs> But anyway, this is very important. So as we work through these, think about if we take that one trichord and I go through and practice each one of the trichords with you know, a, a, its own shape in different directions. So as an example, going up chromatically from one trichord to the next, I could do something like... Okay, just like, that's a simple shape. Or doing something like... You know, just to become conversant with that one trichord quality and being able to improvise purely in a chromatic environment, dealing with I'm only going to improvise using this one shape, this one kind of harmonic thing. Okay? So, you know, as you practice with it, you'll find you'll get better and better with it, and you'll start to get the sound of this trichord. I think all of us at this point, it's a very distinctive sound, right? And Something that's important for those of you who play piano or guitar is that the quality of these trichords changes dramatically depending on how you voice it. So they don't necessarily always sound the same. They're very much just like a three-dimensional object. When you look at a box, let's say we have a box, and you look at it straight on, it's just square. But if I turn it, it looks like a diamond, right? Or if, depending on the what, that way that you look at it, it changes, your perception of it changes. The same thing goes for these. So I'll play that one trichord, which is C, E flat, E flat, and I'll just play some different inversions and with different bass notes, and you'll hear the sound. and different um, colors that are possible within that. Now we kind of take for granted when we hear C major triad or a minor triad, you know, it's got a very specific sound that we're very conditioned to, um, to hear. But these have a lot more complexity going on because of the intervals involved. So I, you know, would suggest you really explore these sounds and really try and get them in your ear. It's a great ear training exercise. And you'll find as you become more familiar with these sounds, when you're listening to music, they pop out and you say, ah, that's one plus two, okay, you know, you recognize it. It's really a great ear training tool. So, anyway, as we go on and we become more conversant in being able to play just purely chromatically with trichords, okay, you know, I would suggest that once you feel comfortable, then you try to improvise just freely through them. And you can combine them in different transpositions and different... For the, very simply and very methodically, I would suggest just purely improvising doing one plus two. You know, so if I I'll play just a, a little bit doing like one plus two only, and just transposing different chromatic things, maybe uh, using common tones and things like that. <laughs> Purely chromatic.
like only playing 1 plus 2. Now combine 2 plus 1 and 1 plus 2. So then those have different kind of sound, even though they're mirrors of each other, they do sound different. So those two together would sound something like... <laughs> But it's useful to maybe set up a certain number of transpositions that you're going to do. Like if I decide I want to play them in whole tone, you know. You know, just like I was just running like whole tone kind of thing and playing different ones. Um, so anyway, once you can kind of do that and you get it under your fingers a little bit, the next step is something that falls outside of the 12 tone row and that using that as your organizing principle, but it's something that's significant because it's used by a lot of composers, Stravinsky being the most um, well known. And what that is, is using common tones under, uh, uh, under inversion to, and under transposition to use, to create coherent voice leading and um, melodic content. So the idea is that, and I'm sure that you know all of you have practiced your modes starting on a common tone, right? So if you play C major and then you play C Dorian and you play C Phrygian and C Lydian and so forth, that's that's all that this is, is using a common tone and then you're rotating uh, the content of the interval content. So if I play the first tricord I could use F. And what I did was I used C as the first pitch of the tricord, C as the second pitch of the tricord, C as the third pitch of the tricord. And these are rotating around C as an axis. Okay? Next, I can use the second pitch of this tricord. Well, you can do that. But that's beyond like dealing with 12 tones. You know, it's just 
common tones. And we do that with rows as well, and that's an important structural thing that, that twelve tone composers use as common tones to connect rows and things like that. Anyway, so now we're going to uh, go from playing in a purely chromatic environment, not dealing with rows. Now we're going to deal with uh, the construction of twelve tone rows. Now, each of the twelve trichord types has a structural pattern that can be created that we can memorize for creating 12-tone row. Now, one thing I, I forgot to mention as we were talking before is that um, we have 12 trichord types, but in fact, only 11 of them, 11 of them you can create 12-tone row using trichords. The diminished triad, right, is the only one that doesn't function using triads making a 12-tone row. With a diminished, tri uh, seven, diminished seventh chord, we can create a 12-tone row. But that's a tetrachord, and that's a four-note chord. So the diminished triads, it's impossible to make a what they call a derived row using three-note three, three chords. Um, so that's kind of the exception to this whole idea of using trichords to create 12-tone rows. Um, anyway, we'll go back, uh, dealing with trichord one plus two. The pattern, and one plus two is a great trichord and row to begin with because it has the fewest variations and it only has one construction. Now the composer Peter Schatt, great Dutch composer, had this um, really nice idea that, that is useful to use. It's a, he a term, coined the term steering, which basically means the distance between the roots of each trichord in a row. So if I have the first note in my first trichord is C, and the second note in that row, uh, the second trichord begins on the note D, right? The third note in that row, uh, third trichord in that row starts on the note F sharp, and the fourth trichord starts on G sharp. You would call that the steering is C to D is two, and D to F sharp is uh, um, four. So you would call that two plus four is the steering. Really, it's a tetrachord because we have four uh, four note steering. So it's C D F sharp G sharp. So it would really be called two plus four plus two. But just to shorthand it, he just calls it 2 plus 4. Because 2 plus 4 plus 2 is really, it's two overlapping 2 plus 4 trichords. Anyway, so the steering of this is 2 plus 4. Yeah, you know, a lot of this is easier if you had like a music thing and I could write it out. But, but in, essentially, um, the idea of steering is basically the same way that we think of, you know, if you break down a tune to its function, you know, rhythm changes, one, six, two, five, right? Well, we're thinking this in terms of the intervals, distance between the roots of each one. So we would say two, four, two, and that will give us the structure. And we could transpose this row, um, it, because it's, all of these rows are symmetric, but this one in particular only has six possible transpositions. So it's very easy to memorize all six transpositions. And each trichord only belongs to one position in the row. So I'm going to play these trichords through this row, just as chords, so you can hear them. There's, what we'll call that is trichord A, trichord B, trichord C, trichord D. Okay? Now, I play them as chords in the smallest possible position, and they're a little more dissonant that way. If you voice them out, they actually start to sound um, more, you know, more pleasing to the ear. But um, what I would like to do is, as we go through and label these according to their position in the row, A, B, C, D, it's important to realize that this row, every trichord, like trichord starting on C, D flat, E flat, it only exists in this one place. Okay? So other rows are a lot more complicated because their trichords can exist in a couple different places in different transpositions of the row. It can get a little, it's a little complicated. I mean, it's not, it's not um, something, it's not like a, uh, something that you don't have to like work at. <laughs> it definitely gets complicated. But the beauty of this is that, you know, a lot of people think that, oh, you can't learn this stuff because it's too complicated. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, in this system of trichords, there's uh, there are a limited number of, of possible combinations of notes. So like in traditional harmony, you know, we have major, minor, uh, uh, major, harmonic minor, melodic minor. So you've got th two forms of minor and then a major scale. You've got all the modes that go inside of there. There's 252 mo modes and 252 chords for all those modes, right? That's what you're dealing with with diatonic harmony. 
But with this system, there's only 177 rows. <laughs> only. Only 170 rows. It's less than diatonic <laughs> Right? So it, you know, and so it's like, it's like, wow, okay, now that you can say that, you know, it's not so bad. <laughs> you know? So so in, in theory, it's really not as complicated as what you already know. So, you know, embrace it. So anyway, um, so what we're going to do now, now that we've labeled these, these trichords, A, B, C, D, for us, what's significant is we want to look at, at them as a harmonic system. So what do they sound like in combination with each other? So when we're improvising, we can choose to just play on one trichord or, or a chord voicing, or just when we're playing free. Yeah, that works. But the interesting things start to happen when we start to combine them, the, the chords from the 12 tone row. So if I take what we call trichord A and trichord B, what, is, what, are, what are the possible sounds that we can get in melodic shapes, number one, uh, in a purely chromatic environment? Because we have to deal with all this stuff in a purely chromatic environment, and then, after understanding it that way, then look at it in the context of diatonic harmony. Because there's a lot of things that we can do that will overlay the structures of the 12 tone system in a really nice, usable way over changes, right? But you've got to be able to deal with them on their own terms first, as what they are, and then, you know, then we, we interpret them uh, over chords. So if I look at these first two, chord A and chord B, okay? Now if I'm going to practice this, I want to be able to internalize this. I have 1 plus 2, 2 plus 1, and they're a whole step apart, right? So what I would do is I would practice you know, this trichord in all its rotations going back and forth between those two trichords. So I would go... Alright? Now that's just going... Remember we talked about the directional thing? That's just going up, 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 up. Now when you start to introduce all these shape things and repeated pitches, you get a lot more interesting kind of complicated melodies, beautiful interval leaps and things that you would not normally get in a diatonic setting, you know? So, that, that was the sound of combining trichord A and trichord B. Now, if I combine trichord A and trichord C, that sound would be this. Okay, now, some of you might recognize that sound, and there's a reason for that, and we'll get into that in a minute. But it's a very familiar sound to us. And each one of these rows has characteristics that we use all the time in jazz. And um, I'll talk about that in a second. But let's continue on. So trichord A and trichord D now. Actually, I'm going to change this. Uh, I'm going to play trichord D first. So I'm going to go trichord D, trichord A, because they're closer to each other. And then versionally, it works out nicer. Okay. Now, so I've gone through and done all the permutations with trichords. A with every other one. Now we're going to look at the other one. So if we take B and C. Okay. And trichord C and D. Uh, sorry, uh, trichord B and D. Ah, anybody recognize that? It's a familiar sound also. Okay. Now the last, uh, and that's it. That's all the combinations that happen in this row. Now the reason that I didn't do C and D is because C and D is just a transposition of A and B. Because it's symmetric at the tritone. Right. So it's exactly the same. So there's no point. There's no other combinations. That's it. There's only those. So it's really, you know, each row has its own kind of set of parameters. This one is the easiest to start working on because it has the fewest variables. And so anyway, let's go back to those sounds that we were talking about that you kind of recognize. The beauty of this row is that, well, every row, but in this row, um, the referencing tonal sound of this row is diminished. And the reason for that is that if we combine set A and set C, and set B and set D, it's two partial diminished scales, a whole step apart. Okay? So we have whole, we have half whole, and then we have whole half. Now this is important functionally when we start to apply these things to, to chord changes because um, there's lots of stuff that, that can be done with two partial diminished scales you know, over chord changes. 
Um, and each one of these rows has its own thing. Like if we looked at row one plus three, we won't get to all of them because this is like, you know, uh, several hour topic. But um, row one plus three ref references symmetric augmented. Right. Row one plus four also references symmetric augmented. Um, row one plus five references diminished. And row two plus two references whole tone. 2 plus 3 references pentatonic, and also a lot of these combinations that can be found in there um, reference uh, Messiaen's modes of limited transposition. They're very, um, they're kind of truncated versions, like abbreviated versions of those, because there's only six pitches in each thing, and some of Messiaen's have more than that. But, but anyway, so each one has its own sound, but they fit within the sounds that we deal with, you know, augmented, diminished, whole tone, you know, all these things that we're used to using in jazz, okay? But in they combine in different ways, though. And when you start combining them in different combinations, you can hide that tonal sound if you wish to, and then kind of you know, um, uh, you know make it a little more mysterious and less obvious. Um, so anyway, as we play through these, you, know, you want to be able to play these trichord combinations as melodies, but also chords. Now, I'm going to play these as chord voicings now. For those of you who play guitar and piano, you can come up with some very interesting and beautiful sounds that you normally would never find. Okay? And, um, so, if we go back and we start again with A and B, uh, I'm going to start, and this is an important aspect of these as well, when you're playing chord voices. If I play A with my left hand and B with my right hand, it's going to sound totally different than B with my left hand and A on my right hand, okay? And we start getting into those total tones. Okay, there's an A in the left hand, B in the right hand. Now I'm going to try some different voicings with the same chords, but um, to give you a sense of what might be possible here, okay? Okay, there's another different voicing. Uh, let's try... Uh, same, same voicing, A in the left hand. Okay, a little different sound. Now I'm going to switch voices. start to look at possible applications. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, let's take a C minor chord. Okay. Now if I play a trichord combination, which would be uh, basically trichord D and trichord uh, A, I'm, gonna, I'm only, only going uh, to play the root and the third in the left hand, because this voicing doesn't have a root. you want 
I explore these textures. Pretty cool sound. Pretty cool sound on C minor. You know? So um, there's a lot of, of possible harmonic applications. Now, granted, you know, if you want to stay diatonic, we can do that. This can be anything you want it to be. I mean, you know, C minor. That's for two plus five. doesn't have to be dissonant. Dissonance is only one part of it. It happens to be kind of the, the interesting part of it for me because, you know, we can, we use a lot of, of um, these kind of shell voicings as, uh, as accompanists sometimes, but not in these combinations. So they're kind of interesting. So anyway, uh, these chords we're dealing with as, as harmonies as well as, as melodies. Okay, um, now talking more about these applications as far as on chord changes. Um, when I was talking about this 1 plus 2 row being functionally two diminished scales, really, with two notes missing from each one, um, if we look in terms of their function, let's say going back to the original key, well, if I start with D, E natural, F, over G7, some other cool things that you can do with this row as well, dealing with, with um, that aspect of diatonicism if you want to look at it in terms of, you know, um, uh, dominant to tonic kind of functions. Uh, another row that's really cool that works this way would be 2 plus 5, which, are, I'm sorry, 2 plus 3. Now this row, if you think in terms of like D minor, G7, we have 2 plus... Uh, flat 7 going to D minor, right? Right? So you have basically the shell of E flat 7 without the, the third going to D, D minor. And then the other two, the other trichord could be functionally on G7. Tricord uh, tri D, which is again 
called it E flat seven before, but now we're on G seven and we're playing E flat, B flat, B flat, right? These are like you know this alter, right? On G seven, then resolving back to C major. discover your own uses because there's a lot more than I'm sure I've discovered. <laughs> you yeah, know, it's, it's great. Feel. When, when you say trichord pairs, you, you mean two? Two trichord of combinations the, derived from taken from the rows and using them as an application on a chord. But, and, but all the examples you've given so far have been uh, two from the same From the same rows so far. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, now you can, you know, we have a choice of, you know, very often when we're using this stuff, there's a lots of flexibility. We can play, we don't have to play a row. You know, we can play one trichord quality. We can play trichord qualities that don't even come from a row. That, as I demonstrated before over C minor, where I played C plus one starting on the root. I played one plus two starting on the nine. I played uh, one plus two starting on the 13. You know, as a voicing on C minor. So, you know, there's just using these chord structures you know, without referencing, you know, any kind of row quality. And then we can apply taking, extracting two trichord combinations that exist in the rows and use those on chord changes without dealing with the row, just those two mm -hmm. trichords. Very much like if any of you are familiar with Jerry Berganzi's system of hexachords, that's all, you know, hexatonics, that's all that really is, but they're different structures of hexatonics. And then we take those hexatonics or those two trichords and then we can um, use them in combination with the remaining two from the rows in patterns either of consonant and dissonance over a chord, or the way I demonstrated over that two five one, where I played all four trichords, but they weren't they weren't really that dissonant. They were all functional in some way. You know, we could analyze them according to you know we chose to use them like you know on the two chord a certain way, on the five chord a certain way. So you know, there's a lot of different ways you can approach this. Um, you know, if you play over pedal point, you know, dealing with with these trichords and playing, you know, in a more constant additional way, it might sound something like um, over C minor, you know, if I, uh, let me pick a... that we can use where we have trichord pairs that have <coughs> notes that function you know, normally in traditional harmony, but that also have dissonant pitches which function as approach notes, which approach pitches, uh, consonant pitches, either and they can be in the same trichord as the consonants or they can be in different trichords. So you, know, you might have a dissonant pitch in this, this trichord and, the, and its resolution is in the next trichord. So that way you have this kind of longer kind of resolution that's happening when you're improvising on these things. You know, you obviously have to be aware of, you know, you're going to resolve this or not. You know, tension and release, all the same things that we do all the time when we improvise. 
as you know on chain as that is. Mm -hmm. So and then third uh, way of approaching these is where you have a one tricord that functions diatonically on a chord in a normal way, and one tricord that functions dissonantly. And, and very often they can function in um, chromatic approach or very often they'll function in kind of a dominant tonic kind of way so that they have kind of a reference of that. So there are like three different ways that, that I write about in the book and that I kind of approach it. Um, because, you know, there's no rules, I mean, about how you use this. It's just basically, you know, um, I find that this method really works for playing on changes, you know. And you can, you know, talk to other people and maybe there are other solutions, you know, that people have found, you know, since it's kind of a wide open field, you know. But. Great! Wow. <laughs> now, first, please, give me a hand. <laughs> Obviously, this, it's a whole language, and um, with every language, uh, for you that already are, uh, is familiar with this, it's great because you can see it within a certain context that you might not be familiar with yet. So, uh, for the com composers amongst you that already know about this, about these te techniques, it's great to hear. Right. How jazz musicians can use this in an improvisational context. Also, you know, one thing I forgot to mention is that this is really useful for us in when we're playing tunes, analyzing melodies, and playing the melody and developing your ideas on the melody. Because you know, when you play a tune, very often, you know, uh, and you want to play motivically, if you can analyze it according to its trichord structure, it gives you a lot more uh, detail as to how you shape that melodic statement. You know. Um, one example that I like to always talk about is, you know, it's, and it lends itself perfectly to this topic is the melody that all, uh, there will never be another you, because that melody is two trichords and they happen to belong to the same the same row, right? So you have two plus two and two plus two, and also it's the um, well, it's easier for me to play actually. So we have 2 plus 2, and then we have 2 plus 5. Okay, so this is... And then we have... There's another 2 plus 2, and then... Which is uh, basically just a fourth chord, right? So that's 2 plus 5. So if you want to develop your melody when you're playing, you know, if I just want to play purely motivically... So I just went between... 2 plus 2 and 2 plus 2, which happen when one starts on G and one starts on C. That's the melody. That's, that's all it is. Right. And then if you want to take this idea of melodic playing and then incorporate the idea of like the 12 tone thing into it, this melody actually works perfectly because it happens to be structurally part of the 12 tone row. If I play... Uh, so it's, it's, it's part of it. So, you know, if you're improvising, there's two different structures for this 12 tone row, but if you played, um, if I played the, the more dissonant of the two, you know, I mean, just dipping into the 12 tone thing, coming back out of it. You know? Yeah, so, very nice. And yeah. you also showed uh, an example of uh, Parker, Parker Lab. Oh, right, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's really useful for, for analyzing melodies mm -hmm. on the spot, you know, and practicing, practicing this. You know, take right. a tune and just practice playing purely the melody, but breaking it into trichords. And, you know, right. what you can do. and even for you that also that is not familiar with this at all, not even, you know, this is the first time you ever heard of this. I'm a big, huge fan of just throwing in, throw yourself in the ocean. Just get in there and just listen to it, absorb the terminology, and, and get at least a vibe, and get a sound there, and get some kind of a reference. And with everything within harmony, and with all the devices that we use in improvisation, you're going to hear it back again, and again, and again, from a different angle, from a different point of perspective. But all that combined will give you more of a palette, more of an understanding of what's possible. 
and will give you give you more creative food to explore. So um, I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, this was amazing. And uh, I would have done this no matter what, even if you guys were not here. I would have said <laughs> can you say this to me again? So uh, I'm very excited about this. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, there will be uh, more coming in our series. More exciting stuff is coming. We will keep you posted. All right. All right, man. The book you can take it. It's uh, it's it'll be in stores I think like in mid April. It's still being distributed in the United States, and it's available in Europe if you're traveling to Europe. So <laughs> yes, come soon. Will come soon to you. Yeah. <laughs>